let's let's pray and, and then we can start. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to gather together tonight. Thank you for um, all the blessings that you you give us in life with our, our family, our friends, um, uh, our health you know, and, and leisure and so on. Lord, we thank you for all your goodness to us. And uh, we do pray that as uh, we study your word tonight, that you would give us strength, um, whether we're feeling uh, tired or, or busy or many things on our mind. Lord, give us the strength to um, to learn together. We pray that this will be a fruitful time uh, for us to grow in knowledge of you and the gospel and to be equipped for our ministry work. So we commit this time to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, it's uh, we're going to begin with the book of Galatians. And just uh, to introduce the book, I think it's very important in life that we are, we beware of fakes, right? And uh, there's a lot of fakes going around in uh, in Malaysia. So now you can just go down to uh, you know your nearest uh, casa, right, and you know you can pick up your Rolex or whatever branded stuff for for very cheap, isn't it? The uh, the fake, right? Uh, if you were from China, then you need to beware of a fake milk powder. There was a whole big trouble that happened there some years ago. Um, and uh, and these days also, you need we need to beware of fake. News. I mean, the, the new thing, new technology recently is the deep fake, right? Where they can uh, make a video that makes it look like you are talking, but it's actually not you. They've just uh, they've rendered the uh, the whole thing quite uh, uh, quite uh, quite scary. Uh, so we live in an age where there's lots of fakes, and it's important that we know um, the truth. Some years back, there was an issue back in my home country where there was. Uh, there were these non-genuine USB cables uh, being sold, and uh, and a few people who were using these cables, they ended up getting electrocuted, and some of them even died uh, from using, you know, just plugging in their their mobile phone. So it's very dangerous sometimes to use the fake, right, instead of the uh, the genuine. Well, uh, that's the main message really of the book of Galatians, right? We must be aware of fake gospels. Uh, because it's only the genuine gospel, the true gospel, that can save us. And fake gospels will steal our joy, they'll steal our freedom in Christ, and they will indeed steal our our salvation. Um, now, let's uh, as we get into it, let's think about some of the, uh, the the background issues first, and then we'll we'll come to the overview of the of, of the text. And the first issue here is uh, of that of audience, right? Who is Paul writing to? Um, in the book of uh, of Galatians. Now, of course, he's writing to the Galatian church, and uh, uh, this uh, uh, we read about Paul planting the the, the various uh, Galatian churches um, in the in the book of Acts. So, if we were to come across to uh, the beginning of of Paul's missionary journeys in Acts uh, thirteen and fourteen, right, we will see uh, Paul planting his his church. Uh, he, we'll see Paul going to Galatia. So he's sent off. Um, his first stop is uh, is in Cyprus, then the city in Antioch, um, and then um, the three cities: Iconium, uh, Lystra, uh, and uh, and uh, the third one is Iconium, Lystra, and uh, Pem. Uh, that Pamphylia is the third one, right? So uh, these are all these are all cities that are that are in Galatia. But the question is, is he writing to northern Galatia or is he writing to uh, southern Galatia? And maybe a, a map here will 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 help us. Here's a map of Paul's uh, missionary journey, and uh, you can see the uh, uh, the direction that he that, that he goes on. So he starts in in Antioch. He goes to Cyprus. Um, and then uh, we have the cities here, right? We've got uh, Antioch, uh, we have Lystra, um, Iconium, um, and then Derby is the third one I was thinking of just now, right? Um, then he comes through Pamphylia, and he loops, he loop, he loops back, going the same, um, the same way. So you can see the the, the Roman uh, region of of Galatia here, and there's a northern part, uh, and there's a southern part. And the churches that he's planted are really in the uh, in the, the the southern southern part here. So the question is: Is he writing to uh, northern Galatia, or is he writing to southern Galatia? And 
the, the traditional approach until about the 19th century was that he was writing to northern Galicia, right? Um, uh, that, that, that's the actual, that is the actual Roman territory called, uh, called Galatia. Um, but uh, the more widely held uh, view is that Paul actually wrote to southern Galatia, and you can see where those, those places are um, now. Um, and these were the, uh, the churches that were planted during Paul's first missionary journey, as we, uh, as, as we just saw. Um, now, this is also suggested by the chronology of, of, of Acts as well, um, because uh, Paul uh, mentions a, uh, a couple of, of, of trips that he makes to Jerusalem. Um, and then, of course, there is the, uh, there's the Jerusalem Council. So his first missionary journey, he begins in chapter 13 and 14 in Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, Derby, these places. Um, this, is, this is where the gospel goes to the Gentiles for the first time. Um, and then as you read in Acts, this is not approved of greatly by um, some of the, the, the Jewish Christians. And it, and it leads to the Jerusalem Council, which happens in uh, in Acts uh, chapter 15. Um, and what we see in Acts, the beginning of Acts chapter 15, is that there are people that are saying that for the Gentiles to be saved, they have to become Jews. Right? So Acts chapter 15 and verse 1, we read this. Uh, Acts 15 and verse 1. Some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And then you can see in verse 5, some believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it's necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law um, of, of Moses. And in response, uh, 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 Peter speaks up uh, and he says there in verse 11, beautifully, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus, just as uh, as as they will. Uh, so, and this is going to be the big question that is being dealt with as we come to the book of, of, of Galatians. What is the nature of the true gospel? Are we saved simply by grace, by putting our faith in Jesus, or um, is it necessary to add on to faith, right? Add on certain works like, uh, like circumcision, like keeping the law and, and, and these kinds of things. So is it grace alone? Or is it grace plus works? Is it faith alone or is it faith plus works? Is it Christ alone or it's Christ plus your own, um, your own merit, your, your, your own effort, right? And this is, this is the issue in Acts chapter 15. And it's also the issue that is going to come up um, in the book of, uh, of, of Galatians. Um, and so because uh, that's the issue in the, those churches that he's, he's planted, and it's the same issue that happens in the Jerusalem Council, it's very likely then that he's writing to those churches that were planted there and therefore he's writing to uh, those places in southern Galatia rather than, you know, the, the, the province uh, per se. So this is Carson's conclusion as he considers all the um, alternative arguments. He says this, from all this, it appears there is no final proof for either the North Galatian or the South Galatian theory, but it surely seems that while the South Galatian theory comes short of complete demonstration, the arguments in its favor are considerably more compelling than those for North, North Galatia, right? So the bottom line, he's writing to these, to these churches here um, that he planted during his uh, first missionary journey and it's it's churches plural so if you look at uh, galatians chapter 1 verse 2 it says to the churches of galatia right so it's he's not writing to one single church but um a group of churches in that region probably the ones from the first missionary journey okay the next issue is one of of authorship and thankfully this one is pretty easy to sort out uh paul, it's, the letter claims to be written by paul Paul, an apostle, not from men or through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. So Paul claims to write the letter. Uh, and in fact, there's quite a lengthy auto, uh, uh, you know, biography of Paul of how he was converted. Um, and then, you know, his various uh, travels before he began his, his missionary journeys. And what this means is that the authorship of Galatians is just not contested at all. Right. So we, we talked about pseudepigraphy last week. 
we saw everyone thinks Paul writes 1 Thessalonians. Um, it's the same here with Galatians. Everyone thinks that Paul wrote Galatians. It's one of his uncontested letters. So that's good news. That means we can just move on. Uh, so the next issue is the time and, and place of, of, of writing. And it does hinge somewhat on the previous question. Is he writing to the north or to the, um, to the south? Um, and it also hinges on how, how we relate things to the book of, of, of Acts. And dating the book of Galatians, really, uh, partly it comes down to dating the autobiography, autobiographical information that we have in Galatians chapters 1 uh, and 2. Because then uh, Paul mentions a couple of trips that he makes to Jerusalem. So if we can map those trips onto the book of Acts, then we, we can know where we're up to in the book of Acts, and therefore we can date when he's writing um, the letter, do you see? So... Uh, right, uh, so that's authorship dating. Um, he mentions two visits to Jerusalem. His first one is in chapter 1, verse 18. He says, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Kephas, and I remained with him 15 days. And then chapter 2, verse 1, after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along um, with me. So he, he must have written the letter after these two trips, obviously, that is mentioned here. So. Um, the first visit, uh, three years after Paul's conversion, is normally matched up with Acts chapter 9, uh, just after Paul's conversion in the story in Acts chapter 9. And then the second visit is usually identified with Acts chapter um, 11, and that places both of them um, before uh, Paul goes on his first missionary journey. So we can line those up in uh, Galatians and Acts together. You'll see what I mean. So chapter 1, verse 18, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Kephas. I remained with him. 15 days and then uh, chapter 9 verse 28 it says uh, 26 sorry when he had come to jerusalem he attempted to join the disciples they were all afraid of him they did not believe that he was a disciple but barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he'd seen the lord and spoke to him and how at damascus he had preached boldly in the name of jesus so he went in and out among them at jerusalem preaching boldly in the name of the lord and the second the second visit we see here after 14 years Going up with Barnabas, we're told in Acts chapter 11, the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. They did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. So you notice Barnabas is also mentioned here and, uh, and, and here. So, uh, yeah, so those are the, uh, those are the two um, trips. Um, so it's it's very likely then that uh, he's he's writing the he's writing the letter of Galatians sometime before um, the Galatian uh, sorry sometime before the Jerusalem Council, which is Acts chapter fifteen. Because uh, as we've seen, the issue at the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter fifteen, right? How are you saved? Do we need to be circumcised? Do we need to keep the law of Moses, etc.? These are the very same issues that we are meeting in the book of Galatians. So it would be very strange, given he's already mentioned two visits to Jerusalem, that he wouldn't mention the Jerusalem Council at all in the book of Galatians. You'd think that that would be a fairly strong and important thing for him to write in Galatians if it had already happened. You know, he could quote, you know, Peter's decision. We believe it's by the grace of the Lord Jesus we will be saved. So the fact that he doesn't mention the, the Jerusalem Council, it probably means that it hasn't happened yet, all right? So um, that allows us to date the letter before um, the uh, the Jerusalem Council, uh, and therefore it would be the Jerusalem Council is AD 48, right? So it's sometime before, um, before then. So here's the summary. Uh, it's likely he's written before the Jerusalem Council, AD 48, from Syrian, Syrian Antioch. Right? Um, this is where he's, he's just been uh, on his missionary journey. Okay, so let's go to the next issue then, and that is occasion and, and purpose. Um, why is he writing the, um, the letter? Um, and it's not difficult to work out. We did look at this uh, last week as we looked at the beginning and end of, of, of Galatians. He's writing the letter because they have been tempted away um, to uh, another uh, another gospel uh, to worship. Um, yeah, they're turning to another gospel that's different from the gospel that that he he preached. Right, um, the churches of Galatia have been infiltrated by some Judaizers. Uh, these are Jewish Christian teachers, right, 
Um, and what they're doing is they are questioning Paul and his gospel, um, insisting that Gentile believers need to be circumcised and they need to keep the law of Moses uh, if they are going to be counted as members of uh, God's family. So you, you, an example of this, chapter 5, if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offence of the cross is being removed. I wish those who would unsettle you would emasculate themselves. It's very strong language, isn't it? It's very, um, very, very strong uh, language. And we see similar language, of course, at the beginning of, of chapter 1. Uh, if anyone preaches a different gospel than the one that I preached, let him be accursed. Uh, and literally what he means there is let that person go to hell. Let them face the eternal judgment of God, right? Uh, it's so such a striking thing to say that he says it a second time, just so we know that he's serious about it. As we've said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed, right? So the uh, Jewish false teachers who've turned up, they're bringing a different gospel. They're saying uh, you must uh, be circumcised to be saved. You must obey the law of um, Moses. And it seems as though the Galatians have started to um, be led astray by this. Right? Maybe they haven't accepted it wholesale, but they've started to be led astray by this. We see an example in chapter 4 um, uh, and verses 8 to 10. It says, formerly when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you've come to know God or rather be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elemental principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? You observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid I may have labored over you uh, in, in vain. Um, so what are these days and months and seasons and years? Well, it's probably a reference to some of those Old Testament laws, like, like the Sabbath day or the various festivals like Pentecost and Passover and, um, and, 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 and all of these things, right? So it seems like they're going, they're going back. They're going back to circumcision. They're going back to uh, the you know, various festivals, maybe the food laws um, as well, and, and, and so on. Uh, and so in, in response to this, this false teaching, this, this teaching that, can actually lead people to hell because they're no longer trusting in the Lord Jesus alone for salvation, but they're now starting to trust in themselves. Paul writes this, this letter, right? Uh, and he wants us to be very, very clear on what the gospel is, the true, genuine gospel, right? We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. It's God's grace. Salvation is a gift that God gives you, not something that you earn or merit by your own works. It's by faith. You receive it by faith, by trusting in what Jesus has done alone, not by uh, your own works. Right? It's not faith plus works. It's faith alone. Right? Um, and it's in, it's in Christ alone. Right? So you're, we're trusting in the finished work of Jesus. We're not trusting in our own um, our own works in any any way, and this is this is very clearly stated in chapter two, of course, chap, uh, Galatians chapter two. It says uh, there in verse fifteen, "We ourselves are Jews by birth, and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ." So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Now, what does that word justi justified mean, justification? Uh, this, this is law court terminology, right? Uh, so if uh, someone is um, accused of a crime, they'll be brought to the, to the law, law court, they'll appeal bill appear before the judge. Right? Um, and after the trial, there will be two, one, one of two sentences will be pronounced, the verdicts will be pronounced. Uh, either they'll be pronounced uh, guilty, and therefore they will be punished, um, or they will 
be declared not guilty and then they will, will go free. So if they are declared to be guilty, right, declared to be in the wrong, that means they have been condemned. If they, if the, but on, if on the other hand, the judge says you're not guilty, right? you're in the right, then that means that you have been justified, right? You've been shown to be in the in the right. Okay? So uh, what Paul is saying is that uh, when it comes to God's judgment throne, right? uh, when we stand before um, before Him on the final day, right? We are justified we had we can be declared right with god only by faith in jesus only because of our faith in jesus not because of our works it's faith alone and not um, not works of, of of the law right um and and what he wants is that to embrace uh works in any way is to actually uh, lose the gospel, lose grace, uh, and therefore lose your salvation. So uh, Galatians chapter 5 is a good example here. He says, For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of, of slavery. That is, Jesus has freed us from that life of slavery to um, you know, to all the to to sin and to the law and trying to obey God, and then we can't, we fail again and again, he set us free. He says, look, I, Paul, say to you, if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. This is, is, is very serious words, isn't it? He's saying to them, look, if you go back to law keeping as a way of trying to earn God's favor or earn your salvation, then it means that you know, if you're putting yourself back under the law, then that means you have to keep all of it. You, you, can't, you can't choose, oh, I'm just going to keep these parts of the law, but, 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 but not these parts. And so I'll do you know, I'll do the circumcision part and I'll do the Ten Commandments, but I won't do all the other laws that is there, right? Um, you're either under the law or you're not under the law, right? And he says, look, if you're under the law, you've got to keep the whole law, and what's the result going to be? It's going to condemn you because you can't keep the whole law. You have, uh, it says, you are severed from Christ. You've lost your connection with Christ. And then you are, you have fallen away from grace. Remember what grace is, right? We said justification is, means to be declared righteous before God. Grace is an undeserved gift, right? Grace is when God gives us something that we don't deserve, that we couldn't earn, right? Uh, sometimes in Sunday school, we use this, this acronym, isn't it? God's riches at Christ's expense, right? Um, it's it's, a, it's a, God's generosity. God's God's undeserved kindness. He lavishes on us. Um, it's not free in the sense that it, it doesn't cost anything. It costs Jesus everything. You know, he, he he dies on the cross so that God can show us show us grace. But for us, it's it's free. For us, it's a free a, a free gift. But you see, the moment that you say, "Oh, yeah, that's great. I'll trust in Jesus' death, fifty percent," and then the the, the other fifty percent is up to my works circumcision law keeping doing good stuff well that's no longer by grace alone is it ultimately now it's it's up to you and if it's up to you well then you're you're in trouble because you cannot perfectly keep the law um, and so you are going to be uh, condemned right uh, so so this is a this is a very serious uh, um, problem, and and that's why Paul uses very severe uh, language in this um, in 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 this letter. Right? He says, "Look, let them be a curse. Let them emasculate themselves." And he's very he's very gets very emotional. He gets um, he gets very passionate um, in in this letter as he tries to persuade them not to take this route because it this really matters. You know, this is this is literally heaven or hell 
kind of stuff. Their, their eternal existence is on the line, right? And so the same as we read this letter, right? We, you know, we, we shouldn't study this as if it's just something that's not very, not very important. Actually, you going to heaven or not, right? And people in your church going to heaven or not depends on whether they understand the book of Galatians, right? Whether they are trusting in Jesus alone for salvation or they're actually trusting um, in themselves. Because there are still plenty of, of, you know, false teachers that go around today with this gospel plus. Now, there are probably not many of them going around saying, well, you know, you, uh, you need to become Jewish, you need to go and get circumcised if you want to go to heaven. You're probably not going to meet many people like that, but they might, they might have other requirements. You, see? you must be, you must be uh, baptized in a particular way, you must belong to a particular don denomination, maybe my denomination, um, we're the only true denomination or something like that. Um, or, you know, you, 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 must, you, must have, you must be a good Christian, right? You must have quiet time, you must pray, you must do this, you must give money to church. If you don't do those things, then you're not a good Christian and God won't be pleased with you. Um, there's a lot of this kind of gospel plus stuff going on uh, around the church. And so we need to be uh, very, very um, uh, careful about this. Let me read this, uh, this quote from, from Carson from our readings. Uh, he says this, Paul immediately recognized that what his converts were doing meant that they were renouncing the heart of the Christian way. He wrote straight away to correct the situation. He did not observe all the niceties of correct letter writing, but sent off an impassioned appeal to the Galatians to return to the faith in which they had been saved. This lively letter has become a classic expression of the meaning of justification by faith, faith alone in Christ um, alone. So one of the one of the, the the ways that we see this is is for example in chapter one. So if you remember, we uh, we looked in the first lecture about the normal structure of a letter, right? So you know you have the greeting, you have the addressee, and then you have your prayer of thanksgiving, etc. And then you know you get into the main body of it. But of course, uh, Galatians is the book that uh, that doesn't quite follow that uh, that pattern. Um, there is no um, prayer of of uh, thanksgiving. Um, in, in the book of Galatians. He just dives straight in. Paul, an apostle, right, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And a great, great little gospel summary, isn't it, of, of the gospel of grace alone. Christ who gave himself for us to deliver us from, our, from the present evil age. And then he's straight in. I'm astonished you're so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ. And it's, it's very different to 1 Thessalonians, isn't it? 1 Thessalonians, Paul to the church, grace. Oh, we give thanks to God for all of this. No prayers of thanksgiving, no prayers at all. He's just straight into scolding them. How could you have done this, guys? What, what, were, you, what were you thinking? Okay, so yeah, so that, that, that's, that's really, the, uh, really the issue. Um, and... In some ways, this issue hasn't gone away. Um, I mean, it was it was the issue in the Reformation, right? um, because the idea of uh, earning your way to salvation was, uh, you know, faith plus works was really, uh, really was and still is what Roman Catholicism is about, right? Um, and so it's not, you know, in Roman Catholicism, it's not uh, it's not grace grace alone, um, but it is it's God's grace mediated or coming to you through your merit and so grace is thought of as a um, something that is stored up by the good works of the saints like mary or whatever and then it, it's dispensed to you through the the church so grace is kind of like uh um, vitamin pills or red bull or something like that and the good christians before you saved up their you know saved up their vitamins and red bull and then if you come to church and do the right things then they can give it to you and then you will have the power right to um, to go on in your Christian life. So it's, it's, it's your own merit or drawing down on the merits of other people, not just God's grace. It's faith. It's uh, not faith alone, but faith plus works, right? So it's not just trusting in Jesus. Let's say if you trust, when you put your trust in Jesus, that wipes out your sins um, before you were baptized, right? But then they say after that, well, you need to 
go through the sacraments of the church. So you need to go through the mass, you need to do penance, you need to have the last rites, and and through all of these works, right, then you um, are making satisfaction for your your sins. So it's, yes, it's faith in Jesus, but it's plus your works. And of course, whatever you don't pay off in your Christian life, then you have to continue to pay off in purgatory before you can go to heaven. Uh, now, that's not a biblical concept, but that's that's what Roman Catholicism taught. And then Christ alone. Um, so in Roman Catholicism, it's not Christ alone, but it's it's Christ plus the human human priest, right? And so you you relate to Christ through the priest. You you go to the priest and you say your confession, or you um, that the priest offers a sacrifice for your sins in the mass, and so on. It's 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 not the finished work of not trusting in the finished work of Jesus but saying that Jesus' work needs to be continued by an, an earthly priest who you need to go through to reach God. So this is the issue in the Reformation. This is why the Reformation was 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 so important. It's why we need to grasp the book of Galatians. Um, it's not that the Roman Catholicism has changed its teaching. The, the official teaching of Roman Catholicism is is still the same. In fact, if you read the, uh, you know, the catechism of the Catholic Church, their official kind of um, doctrinal statement, if you like, then it will have statements in there saying that, um, you know, if, if anyone says that uh, you are only saved by faith alone, I'm paraphrasing, but if, if, if someone says you're only saved by faith alone and nothing more, let him go to hell. And so it's, it's, it's picking up the same words as Galatians, but reversing it, right? Saying, making it say the opposite. And so instead of saying, it's, it, if someone says it's not by faith alone, then go to hell, they're saying, well, if anyone says it is faith alone, then you get to go to hell. This is still official um, Roman Catholic um, doctrine, so this this this, this matters. Um, but the other issue, and we'll, we'll come to this later tonight, is the idea of um, uh, the new perspective on Paul. I don't know if you've heard of this. It's been quite prominent, um, especially in Malaysia, I, I think. Um, and what the new perspective on Paul is saying is that actually oh, we, we misunderstood Paul's teaching about justification by faith. They're saying that the reformers um, misread, essentially they misread Paul when he was teaching about justification by faith alone. And so what they say is that um, things like uh, circumcision, food laws, uh, keeping the Sabbath, um, and these things, these were really just boundary markers, which differentiated Jews um, from others, right? Um, and so they would say that's that's actually what Paul is is opposing, you know, using these things as um, boundary markers to keep other people out of Christianity. Right? Um, they're saying, look, he's he's not attacking an idea of um, works righteousness, trying to earn your way to heaven by your own work. He's just attacking these things as a boundary markers of keeping others out, saying that you must become a Jew in order to become a become a Christian. Um, but that I hope you will come to see, right, is fatally flawed. That's not what Paul is saying here. Right? He is talking about how a person is right with God, how a person is justified before God, um, and that it is by faith, faith alone. So it was an issue in the in, in the Reformation, and it's still an issue in, in in scholarship today. We need to be really, really clear, right. We are saved by grace alone, faith alone, um, in, in Christ alone. Now, in order to uh, discredit Paul and his gospel, it seems that the false teachers have a multi-pronged approach, right? So one of their tactics, it seems, is to discredit Paul as an apostle. Right? Um, because if they can challenge, say, look, he's not really an, a true apostle, then that's why his message is wrong. And so that's why in Galatians 1 and 2, um, you see Paul defending his apostolic authority, right? So you even see that right from, from the beginning of the letter, uh, verse, uh, Galatians 1, verses 1 and 2. He says, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God, uh, through Jesus Christ and God the Father. Uh, and then you can see in verse 11, I would have you know, brothers, 
the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. I did not receive it from men, nor was I taught it. I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. And of course, he's talking about uh, Acts chapter 9 and how um, Jesus appeared to him on the Damascus Road and commissioned him to be an apostle um, of, of, of the Lord Jesus. So it's not that Paul didn't suddenly walk up one day and decided to be an apostle. Jesus appointed him to be an apostle. Jesus gave him, gave him the gospel. It's not his gospel that he made up. It's God's gospel that he is he's preaching. So that's, that, that, that's chapters one and two. And, that, that, and it helps us to see, like, even, even from the first verse, right, where he's, uh, he adds that little extra description about his apostleship. It's already showing you what the theme of the letter is about. And the second verse where he's, he says, look, the, um, Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins. It's already addressing the main issue in the letter. So that's why when we, whenever we come to one of, the, uh, one of Paul's letters, you always look at how it opens. Um, because in those little bits where it's different from the standard introduction, it, it helps you to, to grasp what the, um, what the main point is. So then there's the, set, there's the central section, chapters, chapters three and four, uh, and it's essentially arguing for faith, not law, freedom, not, um, not slavery. Um, and the main argument here is, is looking at uh, God's covenant with Abraham um, in Genesis um, 12 and 15 and arguing that Abraham was justified by faith alone uh, and not by works. Um, and then we have the, the, the second, uh, the third uh, main section is, uh, is Galatians 5 and 6. And it seems that another aspect of the, of the false teachers or the Judaizers' argument against Paul is to say that if you say that we're justified by faith alone, then that inevitably leads to um, bad living, right? immoral living. Uh, I guess the argument goes like this. You know, if I'm not saved by my works, if I'm just saved by trusting in Jesus, then it doesn't matter how I live, right? I, I can just live however I want, and then I, I say, um, you know, I just then I pray a sinner's prayer or something. Um, if I know I'm dying, I just say to God, please forgive me my sins before I die, and and that and that and that's it. So they're saying, look, how how if if this is the true gospel, how can it promote immoral living, right? Um, and so chapters five to six is really uh, defending uh, against this, saying that um, justification by faith alone, it doesn't lead to wrong living. In fact, it leads to righteous living. Um, uh, the opposite is in fact true, right? That if you put yourself under the law and try to relate to God by works, that that's actually what leads to um, immoral uh, living. Uh, let's just see an example of that in, in Galatians chapter uh, chapter 5. So let's pick up from verse 13. It says, you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, Watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Okay. So you can see the, the argument is going to go on to talk about the fruit of the Spirit and the, and the fruit of, um, yeah, the, of the sinful nature of the flesh. Um, and the argument is essentially this. Look, if you are truly put your trust in Jesus by faith alone, then God will give you his Spirit and his Spirit will lead you to live a life of love. And in fact, love is what the whole of the law was about. I mean, we remember that with the Lord Jesus, isn't it? He's asked, you know, what's the greatest commandment? And he says, um, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself, right? Um, love is the fulfillment of the law. Love for God, love for neighbor. It's one way of summarizing the Ten Commandments, isn't it? Ten Commandments have got two, two parts to it, first four, and then the second six. First four, mainly about love for God. You know, don't have other gods, don't make idols, honor God's name, keep Sabbath to the Lord. And then the second six, how to love others. If you love others, you're not going to murder them, lie to them, steal from them, or, or covet their possessions, right? Um, 
and, and they're related, of course, right? Part of the way that you love God is by the way that you love others. Right? Um, so that you can't say that you love God if you don't love others. Um, these are the kind of arguments that uh, the Apostle John made in 1 John. So, so actually, you know, if he's saying, look, if you have truly understood justification by faith, faith alone, then it will lead to righteous living. Because God's spirit will move in your heart, will bring forth the fruit of the spirit, you'll live a life of love, and in fact, you will fulfill the law. And then he said, but he, then he says the opposite is true. If you're not living that way, you know, watch out that you're not, you, you know, uh, what, uh, if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you're not consumed by one another. So if you're living a legalistic life, ironically, you don't keep the law because you don't have God's spirit working in your heart. So only you see the, the, the fruits of the flesh coming out. So uh, again, it's kind of like listening to one end of a conversation, a phone conversation, isn't it? Um, by seeing what Paul says in the letter, you get a sense for what the false teachers must have been saying. So we know that they're teaching a false gospel. Um, we know that false gospel has got something to do with circumcision, keeping the law and so on. And, and, and maybe we see their major attacks. They're trying to undermine his apostolic authority. They're trying to under, you know, uh, emphasize law keeping. And they're trying to say, look, um, a, a gospel of, of grace alone will leads to immoral moral living. Maybe these are the kinds of things that they're saying to the Christians in order to persuade them that they need to go back and follow the law. Um, and, so I, and, and so Paul's going to answer these objections in the, uh, in, in, in the letter. So even though I guess the, these are the three main themes of the letter, which is apostolic authority, justification by faith alone, and then walking by the spirit, not by the flesh, it's actually one seamless argument. Right? And, and these things are kind of woven together all the way through um, the, different, the different sections. Okay, so that's that. That's kind of the, the the big picture. So let's have a look at the structure then, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to see this clearly there. So you can see we've basically got an introduction, we've got a conclusion, and then three main sections in between. Right. So the introduction: it's no other gospel, uh, only Paul's gospel is the true gospel. Then we have the uh, defense of his apostleship. We have the defense of the true gospel of justification by faith alone. And then the call to stand in the freedom of the gospel, where right? we walk um, and, and, and we bring forth the fruit of the spirit, not the fruit of the flesh, and then the, and then the conclusion. Um, you'll see a more uh, detailed version of that in, um, in the lecture notes um, that, 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 that breaks down further, um, but that's essentially um, what, what we're looking at. Okay, let's go on to the issues in scholarship, um, and then uh, we can we can pause for for any questions that we might have. Okay, so what are some of the issues in scholarship that we need to think about? Well, as I've said, the biggest one, far and away, is the idea of um, the new perspective, and we're going to look at that in a lot more detail in the uh, in the second lecture on Romans one to four. Um, after we've gone through Galatians in a bit more um, detail. Um, but let me just give a very brief summary of it here, because I, I find that the new perspective is kind of uh, confusing if you've never heard of it before. Um, and so you kind of need to hear it a few times before you can understand what they're, what they're trying to um, say, right? So the, the new perspective is started with a guy called Sanders, E.P. Sanders. Um, and then there was various people that followed after him, right? So this is James Dunn, um, and most prominently, N.T. Wright. N.T. Wright is one of those um, prolific New Testament scholars. This, you, you've probably um, read some of his, his commentaries and, and, and so on. Um, there's a lot of good stuff that N.T. Wright does, right? Um, his commentary on Colossians, for example, in the Tyndale series, I think is quite excellent. So there's a lot of there's a lot of good things. We're not we're not saying that you know just you know you've just got to throw out everything that someone has ever written. He's a giant of New Testament scholarship, but he's one of the biggest proponents or the biggest proponent of the new perspective um, on Paul. So these people um, they reject the idea that the Jews of the day 
saw keeping the law as the means by which they merited salvation. Let me say that again. Uh, they reject the idea that the Jews of the day were using the law to try to merit salvation, to try and earn their way to salvation. They say, look, actually, that's not what the Jews of Jesus' day thought at all. They weren't trying to earn their way to heaven by keeping, um, keeping the law, right? And instead, what they advocate is something called covenant, a covenantal nomism, covenantal nomism. And um, if you know your Greek, then the word nomos means law, right? Nomos is a law. So covenantal nomism is related to um, the covenant and the law. Um, and that is, uh, what they're arguing is, uh, or what they mean by covenantal norm normism, uh, is that members that you are saved by virtue of membership in the people of God. You are saved by virtue of membership in the people of God. And they argue that keeping the law was not about getting in, but about staying in. Let me try to say that again. They argue that the law was not about getting in, getting into the kingdom, getting into God's people, earning your own salvation, but a way of staying in, right? staying in God's, staying in God's kingdom, staying among uh, uh, among God's people. But if you understand that, it's a very serious attack on the Reformation doctrine of of justification by faith alone. I, I think it's actually very serious and, and something that we um, we should uh, reject, even though it's it's taught in many seminaries. I don't know if it's taught in MBS or not, um, but certainly other other Malaysian seminaries, you, you, you will have people that will teach the new perspective on, on Paul. And maybe as you do some of your assignments, because your exegetical tasks, they're all on uh, uh, Pauline letters, so depending which commentaries you pick up, you know, you may have, you, you know, especially if you pick up commentary from James Dunn, N.T. Wright, etc., right, then you may be exposed to the new perspective on Paul. Right? So that's that, that, that's the first issue. As I said, we'll come back to it in a moment, but that's basically what it's uh, what it's about. Um, second issue is the use of, of rhetoric. So there's lots of, um, you know, Paul's trying to persuade them to his point of view, isn't it? Uh, and so people look at how Paul is trying to persuade people in the letter. Right, third thing, it, the, the issue of or the influence of Gnosticism. Right? Um, so some people have tried to examine what the false teaching is, right? and some people have argued that it was influenced by um, Gnosticism. Right? Now, essentially, Gnosticism comes from the Greek word gnosis, right? um, which means knowledge. Right? Gnosticism is all about having a special knowledge and essentially you um, you become a more mature um, spiritual Christian by virtue of having special knowledge that other people don't have. Um, again, your, uh, Gnosticism became a massive issue in the early church in the second century. Right? Um, there's lots of the early church fathers fought against Gnosticism, right? Um, but what, what you'll find is that a lot of New Testament scholars then read back Gnosticism into the New Testament letters, which is probably unlikely. I think there's a, there, there seems to be uh, the beginnings of Gnostic teaching that you can see in the New Testament, especially in a book like Colossians. We'll come to that eventually. But not full-blown not full blown Gnosticism of the second century. I don't think you, you see that here, especially in the book of Galatians. The issue seems to be much more about um, Judaism. Right? And because we need to remember that all the early Christians were Jews. Right? Um, you know, at Pentecost, um, it was a gathering of Jews, Jews and proselytes. Um, all the apostles were Jewish, Paul was Jewish, um, uh, etc. Uh, it's a, and, and the gospel spread out first in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Um, and then only to the uh, to the Gentiles. So all the early Christians were um, uh, were, were Jewish, and 
And so when the gospel went to the Gentiles for the first time, like it went to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 and then Paul's first missionary journey, this forced the church to then um, grapple with, well, okay, God has accepted the Gentiles, the so Gentiles can be now part of God's people, but how do they belong to God's people? Uh, because they're not Jewish. Do, do they become God's people by becoming Jewish? The way you become a Jew is by getting circumcised and following the law. That's what it means to be Jewish, right? So do they have to do that to be saved? Or is it okay to not be circumcised, not follow the law, to be a Gentile and still be part of God's God's church? This is the big issue you see in the early church. Now, it's no issue for us today because I don't think any uh, any of us are Jewish. I mean, I, one of my, um, I had one uh, classmate when I was going through seminary who was, who was, who was Jewish. He was a Jewish Christian, converted Christian. He was not a Judaizer or anything like that, but he believed the gospel of grace alone um, as his, as, as his father did. Um, it's, but that's pretty rare. I mean, it's very rare to meet any um, Jewish, um, Jewish Christians, most of us Gentiles. So for, for us, this, it's very foreign to us. And the thought of being circumcised never, never entered our, our mind in any, in, in any way. Right? Uh, but, 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 but this was the issue in early church. And I think this is the issue more than the idea of, of, of Gnosticism. Um, the fourth one is the idea of a, of a charismatic agenda. Um, and so some people uh, want to take the kind of modern charismatic movement with the various gifts of the spirit and then try and read that back into um, the book of Galatians. Um, so, for example, if you looked at uh, uh, Galatians chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3, A foolish Galatians who has bewitched you is before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly betrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the spirit to you and work miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? So you can see how, how it's talking about the spirit and miracles and so on, um, how some people might want to read back a kind of modern charismatic um, thing and, and, and see that in the book of, of, of Galatians. But of course, I think that's, that's highly unlikely. Um, and then there are other issues. How does Galatians relate to Romans? Um, what does it mean when Paul talks about uh, pistis crystal, like the faith of Christ? Does that mean... Is it talking about the faith of Christ as in Christ's faithfulness? Or is it talking about faith in Christ, and faith towards Christ? Um, and that affects your understanding of things in certain ways. Um, uh, and, and then maybe one other one other one here in Galatians 3.26. This has been a this has been a big one in our day, especially as it relates to, to uh, feminism and LGBT and these kinds of things. Because it says there there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's no no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. So what, is, what does Paul mean there when he says there's no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female? Is he saying that there's, with the coming of Jesus, there's now no essential difference between men and women? And so, therefore, women should be able to do everything that men can do, including becoming pastors and preaching and, um, and these things. Is he saying that gender's irrelevant? Uh, you, you know, so, so therefore you know, there's, there's no more male or female, and so therefore transgender is okay. And um, you see, th these, are, these are the kinds of things that I issues are coming up today. Sometimes people want to quote Galatians 3 here. Now, what does that verse mean? Is he saying that you know, there's no more gender anymore? It doesn't, you know, there's no more distinction between Jews and Gentiles? That would be a very strange thing to argue, isn't it? Um, no, he's just saying when it comes to salvation, when it comes to being right with God, it doesn't matter whether you are Jew or Greek, slave or 
free, male or female, right? We're all right with God in the same way, right? Which is faith alone, and by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. There's not one way to be safe for men and another way to be safe for women, or if you're rich or if you're poor. No, we all relate in the same way. We're all one in Christ Jesus in that sense. Right? But it doesn't mean that we're no longer men, then we're no longer women, or we're no longer Jewish, and we're no longer Gentiles. You see, that, that's a way of taking the verse out of of context. So this one, one of the things we've got to learn in this, this course is we've always got to read in context. And you'll see that in your in your exegetical assignment that you're, you're you're doing. What you are required to do is not just tell me the meaning of the passage, but tell us the context of the passage. What's the historical context and the literary context? So that you understand the passage correctly, right? This is a good example of that. If you just throw out the context of Galatians, just pluck up that one verse then you can make it mean whatever you like, isn't it? But is that what the word first means? No, right? We're not postmoderns, right? And it's not that uh, the verse means whatever it means to you, but for someone else it means something to them. I mean, we've, we've kind of lived through that age, isn't it? I don't know if you've been through a Bible study like that and, and, and you know, someone says, well, I think the verse means this, and then the next person says, oh, well, that's just your interpretation. Um, and this is what it means for me, um, as if the text could mean different things for for different people. That's postmodernism or relativism, and uh, we've we've lived through that. We're past that, um, and, and and now we're I, I don't know what it is, but it's post postmodernism now, where we're into all the fake uh, fake news and is anything true at all? Or can, yeah, there's there's a whole we're in a whole new world of it now, right? Uh, but but that's 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 not how you read the scriptures. What does the scriptures mean? The scriptures mean what the original author intended them to mean. That's why we're asking what's the big idea and what's the big aim? What was the author's intention? Why did he write this? Right? And that's why we're doing this background work. You know, what what was the context? What what was the situation that led Paul to write the letter? Because as you can grasp that, right, then you'll understand what is written correctly. And then you can apply it to your life correctly today. But what, if you just throw out the context and you just take a verse here and there, um, you, you hear something about miracles in the spirit, you think that took, means the charismatic movement, or you, you see we're all one in Christ. And so that means it's, you know, we were into feminism and transgenderism. Then you've, 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 totally lost, you've totally lost the plot. You're not handling the scriptures faithfully anymore. So it's, this is an intro course. But this is the idea is that um, we, we want to learn how to handle the New Testament letters faithfully. We want to have the principles so that whatever passage we come to, we're able to, um, to deal with it rightly. Okay, I've got one more thing to say here, and then we'll, we'll, we'll take our break. So let's think about the theological uh, contribution. Again, this is, this is not too difficult, right? The main contribution of Galatians is justification by faith alone, right? Only can be saved by trusting in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. That's the main contribution of Galatians. Second, biblical theology. Um, I think Paul's arguments, especially in chapters 3 and 4, give us a really good model and framework for how to read and apply the Old Testament in the light of Jesus. Because remember what he's doing in chapters three and four is he's arguing that, well, we've always been saved by faith alone and not by works of the law. And then he goes back to, um, to, to Abraham. So let's have a look at Galatians chapter three again, and, and we'll see that here. It's very interesting how he works from the Old Testament to the New Testament. So Galatians chapter three and... Let's pick it up from verse uh, 6. Just as Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And what's that saying there? Um, and then this is, this is a quote. I, you can see the quotations marks there. This is uh, Genesis 15, verse 6. Do you remember the context in Genesis? Um, God had promised Abraham... Um, 
blog, fame, land, offspring, blessing. He's going to make him into a great nation, bless him, bless all nations through him, right? But he didn't have a child. Um, Sarah, Sarah, his wife, was barren and, 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 and so on. And so that's what Abraham says. He says, uh, um, what will you give me? For I continue childless. And, and then God says, your very own son shall be your, your heir. Look towards heaven. Number the stars if you're able to number, number them. So shall your offspring be. And then Abraham's response. He believed God, the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. It's a remarkable thing that Abraham does. Right? His situation hasn't changed in any way. Right? He's still old. Sarah is still um, child, bar uh, barren, childless. They don't have a child. But he hears God's word of promise. And he simply believes it. And God says, God's word says, he counted it to him as righteousness. Right? He declared him righteous. Right? So we, we need to remember when we're talking about the idea of justification, we're not saying that God makes someone righteous. This is what we call imputed righteousness. We're talking about God declares someone righteous. He gives them a status of being righteous. Right? even though they're not, right? Abraham's a sinner like, like all of us, but God says, because of your faith, you are, you are righteous. The idea of um, imparted righteousness or making someone righteous, that's Roman Catholicism, right? God gives you grace to make you into a righteous person so that you can earn your way to heaven. Not the gospel, that's false gospel, right? But that's Roman Catholicism, imparted righteousness. True gospel, which we see here, for example, in Genesis fifteen six, is the idea of imputed righteousness, right? or what you might say alien righteousness, where God gives you righteousness as a gift. Um, the the reformers would uh, talk about uh, there was a Latin phrase, I think it's something like this: "simul justice et peccator." At the same time, sinner and saint, saint and sinner. Um, and the, the idea is that in and of yourself, we're still sinners. But by virtue of our faith in Jesus, we are declared, accounted to be righteous. So we're, we're both at the same time. We're sinners and we're saints at, 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 the, at the same time. That's the true gospel. That's the idea of imputed righteousness or a declaration of, of, of righteousness. So that's that. That's what happened with Abraham. And so uh, now we can see how Paul applies this um, in his argument in, in, in Galatians. Uh, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And remember, the sons is important because uh, the sons of Abraham are those who share in the promise and the blessings, right, of, of Abraham. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. That's very interesting, isn't it? He's saying, look, when God made that promise, in you shall all the nations be blessed. That's Genesis 12 and verse 3. Right? I'll bless those who bless you, him who dishonors you, I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Um, saying, well, God preached the gospel to him because that's, that's the gospel, that if we trust God's word of promise like Abraham did, then we will be, we'll be blessed, all nations. Will be, will be blessed. And what is the blessing? Well, the blessing is this, isn't it? It's the idea of being justified, of being declared right with God. I, I remember one time I was invited to teach a course in a in another church. I won't name the church, um, but I was I was invited there to, um, you know, to go to the church and one of the Sunday services and to. 
promote the, the, the course before they, they started it because about one third of the church signed up for the, for the course in the end. Um, and uh, on that day, the pastor was preaching about, uh, she was the, it was the pastor's wife that was preaching, was preaching on uh, Genesis chapter 12. Right? and the promises to Abraham. And, 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 and she was saying, look, uh, God promised Abraham that he would be blessed and through him all nations would be blessed. And then she said, um, uh, and that blessing is now available to us. Look at Galatians chapter 3, right? Uh, if we put our faith in Jesus, then we share in the blessing of Abraham. And I'm thinking, oh, this is great. You know, right? what, a, what a great sermon, right? Um, and then she said, what are the blessings of Abraham? What is it that God's going to bless us? And then she said, well, God made Abraham rich. God gave him lots of flocks and herds and, 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 and so on, lots of money. God made, him, God made him rich. And then she went to Deuteronomy chapter 28, where it says there, if you obey, then God's going to bless you. And, what, and the blessings in Deuteronomy 28, as you might know in the Old Covenant, are physical blessings like prosperity and and, and, and and these kinds of things. And then she came back to Galatians 3 and she said, look, if you put your faith in Jesus, he's going to bless you. He's going to make you successful. He's going to make you rich. He's going to heal you of all of your diseases. He's going to be prosperity, prosperity gospel. Um, and it was bad handling of the Old Testament, right? It was... It was taking the Old Test those Old Testament verses out of their biblical context because Galatians chapter three tells you how to understand the promises to Abraham. Right? What is the blessing of Abraham? It's justification. That was the blessing that Abraham had. He believed God; he was counted righteous. If we believe like Abraham had, we are blessed like Abraham did, which means we are also. Justified, we're also declared righteous, counted righteous, just like Abraham was. That's that that's that that's the point. That's what the blessing is. It's got nothing to do with becoming rich, you see. That that's the point of the of the old covenant. In fact, the whole argument of Galatians is that we're no longer under the law and we're no longer under the old covenant, which which, which says all of these these things. And and that's exactly what he says just after this, um, in verses 10 to 14. All who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, for it's written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law and do them. That's Deuteronomy 27, just before Deuteronomy 28. It's evident that no one is justified by, by, before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. That's Habakkuk 2 verse 4. The law is not of faith, rather the one who does these things shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who's hanged on the tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, that we might receive the promise through it through faith. The point is this. In the old covenant, if you obey, you are blessed. If you disobey, you are cursed. And what Paul is saying here is Jesus took that curse that we all deserve. We've all broken the law. We all deserve to be cursed. But on the cross, Jesus took the curse. He died on the cross. He took the punishment that we deserve for our law breaking. Right? He redeemed us from the curse of the law. And that means that now we can have the blessing of Abraham, which is to be counted righteous, right? to be to be just. Because he's already taken our punishment away. So that now we can be counted righteous. But if you Say, no, I'm not putting my faith in Jesus alone. I'm going to put myself back under the Old Testament law. Well, what's the result going to be? You are going to face the curse because cursed is everyone who does not abide by all the things. And if you put yourself under the law, you've got to obey all of the law. And you can't do it. Right? And so the result is you are going to be condemned by God. There's only one way to be righteous, and that is not by your work, it is by trusting entirely in what Jesus has, has done. So it's a great example of how to understand the Old Testament in the light of the gospel. Right? It's teaching us how to read the Old Testament in the light of 
the cross. And that is such an important thing to learn. Now, it's not just this passage. There's other, other parts later on where it talks about Hagar and, and Ishmael and all the rest of it. Um, the, there are other examples we could look at here. But he's, he's helping us to read the Old Testament Christologically, right? In the light of the, in the light of the of, of the gospel. Okay, and then the, the last uh, contribution is the idea of Christian um, freedom, right? That is, the gospel brings true freedom. Um, religion is enslaving, um, but the gospel makes you free to love. Um, I don't know if you ever thought about this, but unless you believe the gospel of grace, then you can never love other people genuinely. So think of like the, the Mormon missionary or something um, who's knocking.